Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness, for all of those who participated today in giving honor to our blessed Lord. And we just pray for your mantle to come down upon the service and upon the word, and we just pray that you will speak to our hearts, Lord, in whatever way that you wish, and we just pray that we would respond to you, and just pray your anointing upon this gathering, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And I've entitled this Christmas message, Participants of the First Advent. And when you study the attributes of those that discovered Christ in the first advent, kind of gives us a little picture or a little preview of those who are going to meet him in the second advent. And always bear in mind there are certain requirements for those who are going to have a part of this special occasion. It's a privilege, and there are certain requirements. Whether it was the first advent or the second advent, there were certain attributes necessary. But when you consider the birth of Christ, most of Israel was, uh, they weren't aware of what was going on. And in fact, most of God's people, uh, you know, were unaware of what was taking place here. They didn't recognize God's time. They did not recognize God's season. But we want to take a look at those who did. Because, as I said, it gives us a little preview of those who will be participants of the second advent, that is, the second coming. We want to be in sync with heaven in these days because we're living in times when this age is going to close out. But let's first consider the wise men or the magi. These men were seekers and they had an understanding of the times. Now, we're looking at Matthew 2 and first two verses here. They were seekers and they had an understanding of the times in which they lived. And beginning in verse 1, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now, these men were truly wise because they understood their times, and the season in which they lived. And that is a quality that not all of God's people possess. But they knew their times, they knew the seasons. And as you will recall from Scripture, the sons of Issachar were a tribe that had an understanding of the times in which they lived, and they knew what Israel ought to do during that time. And so I'm looking at another verse here in First Chronicles, in chapter 12 and verse 32, these men had an understanding of the times in which they lived. And it reads, And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. Now, here is a definite attribute of the wise men and the wise virgins. Remember, it's the wise virgins who enter in at the end to this special occasion in heaven, this banquet in heaven. And these wise men must have been influenced by some of the writings of Daniel. You know, Daniel was a part of the Magi about five centuries earlier, and they must have been influenced by some of his writings. But these men knew their times, and they saw the signs, and they were seeking for this great king to be born. And we can only imagine the cost, because when you think of the wise men, I mean, usually contemporary Christianity pictures three wise men coming. But these men were men of importance and wealth. They probably had soldiers. It was probably 
uh, a little expedition that came. And, uh, of course, they traveled at night. But if they were coming from the area where we think they were, down in the lower part of Persia, it probably was a six, 700-mile trip. It probably took them months, and it was a lot of expense in this little trip. But they were seekers. They wanted to meet with this one that was born, seeking the great king. But you can imagine the cost and the investment here and the time taken to get there and to get back. But that's the point. They were seekers, and if I could be as bold as to say this, it's going to be the seekers who go out to meet him in the second advent as well. We want to be seekers, amen? We want to be looking. We want to understand our times, and we want to be hear the call, go ye out to meet him. Amen? And, you know, the scripture says, while you were seeking me, I will be found. And again, remember, it was the wise virgins that went out. They entered into the banquet. The others did not. In Jeremiah 29 and verse 13, Jeremiah said, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye search for me with all of your heart. And we want to be true seekers. So here's a revelation of those who are going to have a part of this second advent. Now the second group here that had a part of this first advent was the faithful shepherds. So I believe we heard this read this morning, but in Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, It says, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, here's a nice picture of the faithful shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. And they weren't out to fleece the flock as some of the shepherds that we see in Ezekiel 34. Their main interest was the care for their Sheep, their flock. There's a faithful pastors keeping watch over their flock. Now I'm just quoting a couple of verses here from Ezekiel because this gives us a picture of the kind of shepherds that aren't going to be in on what is taking place here at the end of the age. But in Ezekiel 34 and verse 2, beginning in verse 2, Ezekiel was going to prophesy against these shepherds who were just out for the take. They weren't interested in watching over their flocks by night, but in Ezekiel 34, 2, it says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? And dropping down to verse 4, and it says, The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And so I think this gives us a little picture here, great distinction between faithful shepherds and those who are just out to, you know, to gain from their flock. But the faithful shepherds were keeping watch. And unfortunately, a lot of ministers today don't fit into that category. They're living actually quite opulently at the expense of their people. These are not the kind of shepherds that worship the babe in Bethlehem, and they're not the type of shepherds that will be a part of the banquet in heaven. It's the faithful who shall be there as the carol goes, O come all ye faithful. So we want to be faithful 
in our everyday activities, in the little things. We want to be aware of our times. We want to be people that enter into that beautiful occasion, the second advent that's coming. So whether they were a part of the first advent, they were faithful, and if we're going to be a part of the second advent, then we have to be faithful too. I've been on the the hills there outside of Bethlehem. They've so commercialized everything there that, you know, there's no nostalgia there because you just see all kinds of buildings and selling things and, you know, it's so commercialized that there's no real anointing. But um, anyway, God reveals his himself or his truths to the true shepherds who in turn then reveal those truths to the flock. So faithfulness is a prerequisite for the second advent. As Jesus said, when I come, shall I find faith on the earth? So we want to be those who are faithful in these times. Those who return with Christ uh, from the supper, those who have the, you know, are privileged to, to enter into that supper at the end and return with him are called chosen and faithful. Called, chosen, and faithful. And then in the third category here, um, third category could be categorized by Simeon the Just. And he's a righteous man, he's anointed, and he had the witness that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Christ. And so, let's look at Luke 2 for a minute, Luke 2.25. And looking at Simeon the Just. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Verse 26, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Uh, This man had the privilege of seeing Christ in the first advent, And not only that, I mean, if you can imagine, he has the privilege of picking up this little child who is a son of God and also giving prophetic words to his parents. I mean, this man had an anointing upon him. He was um, a righteous man. He was devout in his faith. And he gives us a picture of those who will have part in the second advent. He had a witness of the Spirit. He was righteous, but we're told in Revelation chapter 19 that those who are part of this company that enters in in the second coming are those who have had the righteousness of God worked into their garments, threaded into their garments. So they prepared themselves. They've allowed God to work in their lives. And I just want us to get a little simulation here of you know, the the similarity between that first advent and the second advent, because those who had a part of the first advent had certain attributes that we need to have to be a part of the second advent. Are you with me here? So it was not all of God's people that were included here in the first advent and won't be in the second either. Um. Now, Jesus actually warns his people to, he's warning some that are going to miss perhaps the first part of this Advent, to be ready when he returns from the supper in Luke twelve thirty six. But they obviously did not meet the criterion that was necessary. And then we have another person here who was privy to the first Advent, which represents another feature of the bride, and that is Anna, the prophetess. And 
here is a woman who had the word of the Lord. She was in constant communion with heaven. She was a woman of prayer. And, um, you know, she was privileged to enter in to see this newborn king and then to proclaim him to all that were looking for redemption. And that would probably be a more exclusive group. But again, we're in Luke chapter 2. And beginning in verse 36, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Azur. She was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayer night and day. And she coming in at that instant, this is when Christ was... uh, being dedicated, well, actually, Mary was coming in. She was offering a sin offering, but this is 40 days after his birth. And she coming in at that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Here's a woman who was in communion with heaven, and she's a true worshiper. Here is a person who devoted her life to prayer and fasting. And, of course, we can't expect all of God's people to to live in that mode of prayer and fasting. Uh, I mean, she's 84 years old. Um, She devoted the rest of her life to prayer and fasting. But the point is, um, we don't want to waste our time here on earth because I think... I mean, I'm guilty myself. Sometimes I I feel guilty just sitting in front of the TV and just, you know, I'm watching things. Um, I'm like, afterwards I think, no, you know, I just wasted an evening. And, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to hang a guilt trip on anybody, but, I mean, it's okay once in a while. But, you know, we don't want to waste our life here. We want to devote our time, and we want to know our times. We're living in a generation, the closeout of a generation, and although I believe it's a little little ways off yet, you know, we want to live with eternity in view. Amen? And we don't want to be, you know, a hit-and-miss type of Christian and we see those in the Christmas story, they're committed, aren't they? And we want to be committed in these days in which we live so that we can be a part of the second advent. So they were wise, they were seekers, they were faithful, they were righteous, there was an anointing upon them, they were devout, there was communion life. In this Anna, she was in communion with heaven. And we don't want to think that it's going to be any different for those who meet him the next time. We have to be living circumspect in these days. Do you believe we can't be careless? I mean, as I said, it may be a little while off yet. There's a lot that's going to take place here in a short time. But we're coming into that final segment of time that's going to close out the age, and remember, those at the banquet table are called, chosen, and faithful. Another little interesting aspect of this story is concerning the detour down into Egypt. Now, Matthew is the only author that that records this little detour. He gives us the account, and In Matthew chapter 2, in verse 13, it says, And when they were departed, that is, the wise men, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt 
and there was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord, by the prophet saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Well, Christ was born about 4 B.C. Doesn't make sense of this. He was born 4 B.C. <laughs> Actually, that was because of a mistake made on a calendar by a monk in the 4th, no, it was the 6th century, named by a man by the name of Dionysius Exeduus. Of course, everybody's heard of that guy, right? But he made a four-year mistake on the calendar. That's why we have the birth of Christ at 4 B.C. He made a four-year mistake. Uh, that's recognized by the secular world as well as the church. But uh, So 4 B.C., Christ is going down into Egypt with his parents. He's being taken down by his parents into Egypt. Until the death of Herod, and I think, uh, I think the most accurate record of the death of Herod was 1 BC. So they were in Egypt between three and four years. And it's interesting because, um, you know, he had to fulfill scripture. He had to fulfill Hosea chapter 11. Verse 1, um, out of Egypt have I called my son. He had to fulfill those scriptures. But I think this three and a half year scenario also gives us another picture that foreshadows the second coming. Because in Revelation 12, we see where the woman is protected for three and a half years in the wilderness. And 1,260 days, with, which is exactly three and a half years. And um, so, again, I, I see this, this birth of Christ foreshadowing the last days. And I'm looking at Revelation 12.6. I'm almost through here, but Revelation 12.6. Now, this is, this is taking place right in the middle of the last seven-year period. And right in the middle of that last seven year begins a great trial, great tribulation. And the woman is protected for three and a half years, for 1260 days. And in Revelation 12, 6, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. 1260 days, which is three and a half years. Same time that Christ was taken down into Egypt for about three and a half years from his birth till the death of Herod. I think it's very interesting. I think it gives us a little picture, too, of, of things to come. But she's only protected for 1260, and I believe the reason for that is because that's when the church is taken up at the end of that 1260. But... Just continue to bear in mind here our main thought. We're getting a little preview of uh, the second advent by considering the first advent. It's interesting. I've been in Egypt, um, and uh, we they have a house there that they claim, uh, you know, the Holy Family stayed in. Now, how they could ever come up with that is is an amazement to me. But schemers and money makers can come up with anything. How they could say the Holy Family was here because uh, Christ didn't come to ministry to thirty days later, or thirty days, thirty years later, <laughs> and how they could ever connect, say, oh, this was the family that was down here. But anyway, they're making money off this uh, place there. And if you ever go to Cairo, you can uh, tour this place if you'd like to. But uh, I think it's a waste of money as far as that goes. But um, one thing I did appreciate in Egypt was uh, a nativity. Um, it wasn't just a nativity. It was a, it was a Christmas program. And um, it's put on by the Anglicans, actually. 
It was pretty neat. It was actually quite humorous. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before to you, but uh, at the end of this um, this nativity scene there in Cairo, uh, the Anglican minister gave a very good uh, invitation to Christ. It was very nice. Did a very good job presenting Christ. So if you're ever in Cairo around Christmas time, be sure to go to this uh, nativity. But let me just wrap this up by emphasizing the need to imitate the examples that we see at the first birth of Christ. We want to be people that have an understanding of our times, the day that we're living in. We want to be wise. We don't want to, we want to be circumspect. We don't want to be sidetracked by the world. We want to be devout and faithful in our relationship with the Lord and in the church. And we want to be in communion with heaven in these days. Amen? Because these are the same kind of people You see back the birth of Christ, they're the same kind of people that are going to be represented at the second coming as well. All of those features are going to be those who enter into the banquet at the end. So let's seek after him and his righteousness and be counted worthy to have a part of what the Lord does in our day. Amen.